Fire Emblem has returned as one of Nintendo's biggest franchises with an increasingly growing fan base. And like a lot of the growing fan base, I had never experienced any of the older titles. So making a remake of one of those older titles makes a lot of sense. You get to satisfy some curiosity from some older fans, as well as give some newer fans some much needed service. However, the ultimate question is, which game do you do a remake of? I mean, Nintendo did try remaking Shadow Dragon, the very first Fire Emblem game, on the DS, which universal consensus on that thing says it's pretty awful and it just looks ugly if you look at any screenshots or video footage of the game. So, basically, they're thinking, why not just do the second Fire Emblem game, which, like a lot of Nintendo sequels, especially from original franchises, is completely different from the franchise it spawned from. Essentially, Fire Emblem Gaiden is like, Mario 2, Zelda 2, and so many other 2's in Nintendo canon. And, well, they remake it and thus create this new generation of it, as dubbed Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valentia. With that said, this game is my first taste of old school Fire Emblem games, and I have to say, I really did enjoy what I played. I know I can't really use this as a true judge for the older games considering, you know, it's a Gaiden game. I mean, Gaiden's literally in the title of the original release, but it's a good entry point for the older content if you have trouble getting into it like I do. However, this game is still obviously very odd for a Fire Emblem title. The battles are a lot quicker, focusing more on the dungeon crawling than just moving from battle to battle to battle like in other Fire Emblem games. But on top of that, the weapon triangle isn't a thing in this game, which honestly is a major shame. But no weapon triangles, certain battles, especially against armored units, can drag on, especially, especially something some of the later, later maps where you're against multiple armored units at once. Like, literally the entire map is armored units. And they only seem to be weak to magic, which are mages being extremely squishy. Honestly, that's pretty much just a major minor complaint, not really a major thing wrong with the game, just something I have a major issue with in the game. The main thing that sets this game apart from most other Fire Emblem games is the dungeon exploration, and it honestly does feel enjoyable and good. You'll come face to face with some enemies leading to some entertainingly very quick battles, and removing and basically removing a new weapon system with weapon skills and stuff like that is entertaining. I mean again I still miss the I still miss the uh weapon triangle. But this new weapon skills and weapon abilities things is actually pretty interesting. I kind of want to see that in a new Fire Emblem game. And the special moves are actually really fun to witness. I kind of wish they had something like this in a newer game instead of just having class skills. Like, you know, equipping a character with the killing edge can let them use some super killing critical strike attack or something like that. And of course then there's the story. Now Fire Emblem Fates had some interesting elements to its tale. But honestly, it couldn't make it all work together in one cohesive whole, which is kind of a major shame. But here the story is a lot simpler and works because of it. The characters are great and given a lot of added character from their original incarnations. A lot of them are just, in their original incarnation, just 2D sprites. And hell, they even managed to make a bit of a connection to Awakening for all those worried if it would move too far away from your precious waifu simulator. I'm joking, I love that game myself as well. And before I move on, I just have to say, while I do like the more anime-esque art style they use for some of the newer games, well, all the newer games, I honestly, I like this more classical art style too. I do want to see them keep using the more anime style for the newer games because it's a visual counterpoint to set the two generations of Fire apart. But I wouldn't mind a return to this more traditional art style if they just want to use it for one or two games or so. Maybe it makes it up every other game. I try to do a good combination of both, which honestly seems like it'd be hard to do. So yeah, this is honestly a worthy Fire Emblem into the whole lexicon, and I hope that we get more Echoes titles and this becomes a subheaded version of Fire Emblem that gets remakes of older games, which would be really cool. Maybe they could actually get a remade good version of Shadow Dragon out there, I don't know. Platinum Games. As a studio, they're either one of two things. Either they're firing on all cylinders or putting in solo effort. You barely wonder if they just didn't subcontract a group like Gearbox did with Alias Home Marines. But I'm happy to report for Neurotomata, 
they actually were on full blast for this game. Now before I talk any more about the game, I do want to mention someone else on YouTube, another YouTuber, who influenced me to check this game out. Uh, Mr. Klimps, everybody. He's gone over most of the works of a Mr. Yoko Taro, the man behind Nier Automata, the Nier games, and Drakengard, which Nier is a spinoff of. And, yeah, his works piqued my interest. If you want to take a look at Mr. Klimps' channel, he has... Have a lot of detail. He does have a lot of detailed work on some very obscure JRPGs and RPGs in general, and he's even planned to do a full-blown analysis of Nier Automata as he's done for Nier and the various Street Dragon Guard games. So yeah, take a look at that. Anyway, enough shilling out someone who helped me pick up a really cool game. Let's talk about the game itself. Let's talk about Yoko Taro for a second. Yoko Taro is a very intriguing person. Not just for the fact he goes around wearing his cosplay for press interviews, although I do kind of want to do that. Uh, basically, his work intrigues me in a sort of way that Suda51 games tend to do, or at least the good Suda51 games tend to do. His games are kind of trying to make a point while telling an interesting story, and often these stories are very, very depressing, and I love them for it. Uh, the kind of thing that made me not previously play Drakengard games, as well as even the original Nier, was I honestly found the gameplay lacking. A story can be intriguing as all hell, but similar to a Nintendo mindset, the gameplay is a bit of a bore and I'm pretty much going to stay away from it. Uh, there's an old quote, I forget exactly who said it, from someone Nintendo said that uh, you don't really need graphics or you don't really need graphics or story for a game, you just need excellent gameplay and considering it's a game they're right and well, that was was keeping away from the Drakengard games as well as Nier, well the original Nier, which, did, which technically speaking was better than all three Drakengard games. But then we come to Nier Automata, and I have to say, it's a truly great and fun experience. The plot takes place hundreds of years in the future after the original Nier, which again is a spinoff of Drakengard One, where aliens have invaded and humanity has fled to the moon. So. Supposedly, uh, you can't see, but I'm still doing giant air quotes and uh, got my fingers. Uh, anyway, the humans send androids to combat the alien menace, known as the Yor known as the Yorha Project. From there on, we follow the adventures of 2B and INS as they battle the machine life forms in an attempt to save the Earth for their human masters. With a plot like that, you don't really expect a lot of stuff. It's just a simple video game plot. But very quickly, the plot seems to go in a different direction. Machines are acting a lot more human, and not as they kill crazy monsters as you expect them to be. Basically, the biggest question on the lips of this video game is, what makes someone human? What makes life worth living? As well as a bunch of existentialism. And saying anything more than that would just count as spoilers for the overall thing. Honestly, there are a ton of videos on YouTube trying to explain what exactly the game is trying to say with this message. And while I can get the basics of what I want, the basics of what the game's telling me, I honestly want people to experience this as blind as possible so they can pull their own conclusions from the overall story and what it's telling you. But I'm going to tell you one thing. This game has multiple endings as well as different routes. Some are joke endings, such as when you get game overs and don't get to continue. And others of them are, well, the things you unlock by playing the game normally and just happen to end that. However, after you play the game even the first time and the second time, you'll more often not get an ending and just think the game is over. But it's not. There's more to do. Just go back and see what's happening. There's a new route to, to, there's a new route to discover. Just go back and do it. Trust me. You don't want to waste. You don't want to miss out on some of this stuff. It's really great. Outside of story stuff... The gameplay is very Bayonetta-esque, and I freaking love that. There's a lot of quick movements, quick dodging, and basically peeping the pressure on enemies with bullets and with bullets and swords at the same time, and dear god, it's so cool and it's awesome. Again, this game is quick and it's fun and it's absolutely beautiful. For the post-apocalypse, or like the third or fourth one, considering the fact this is the near universe, and... Don't worry about the lore stuff, it barely comes up, I'll set a few references here and there. It very rarely looks all that bleak and depressing, it looks very beautiful. You will completely understand the game just by playing it, 
which is good for the story, but if you do want to find out more about the story as well as what happened in the previous games, take a look at Mr. Eclipse's channel as I stated earlier. Again, the visuals are just generally beautiful and I do love the art direction. Again, the post-apocalypse has never looked so freaking good. Well, except for when it's been very colorful. And before I mention anything else or move on from this, I just want to say this is one of the best game soundtracks of the year. And that's saying something considering Cuphead and some other games that we'll be getting into later have some really amazing game soundtracks. Again, this has just been a very good year for video games, people. I mean, last year has been. Again, this soundtrack is quite possibly the best of the year, and I don't say that lightly. Seriously, if you want to listen, you can find a bunch of the tracks on YouTube, but if you really want to own it, it's on Amazon. You can download it off Amazon. And they apparently released a track that has all the unused song tracks, and they're, I just want all these tracks in my iTunes right now. I want them. So, back when I did the recommendation list, which was in the intro video to this whole little series, I did a quick second about ARMS. And I mentioned that there was another mostly online Nintendo game on the list that beat out ARMS for being on the list, and of course, it's Splatoon 2. Splatoon was one of the most amazing, refreshing experiences in a shooter genre I had experienced. It was one of my favorite games on the Wii U. I had a lot of fun with it, and when the Switch, when it was still called the NX at the time, was coming out, I questioned whether or not they just go with a straight port or a sequel, considering the fact that, again, Splatoon was one of the biggest games on the Wii U, so it makes sense for Nintendo's next big console to have it on there. And at the Switch event, they announced the game, and I fell in love yet again. Splatoon 2 is great, but it uses a lot of the assets of the original game, and there's a lot that's been, well, there's been a lot of debate about whether this game is technically an enhanced port or a true sequel. I have to say, especially considering its placement on this very list, I'm leaning more towards sequel side than straight port side. While I could ask for a bit more, I'm actually happy with what we have, and I have, similar to the original Splatoon, added more content over time to make the game feel like it's more of its own thing than just, you know, Splatoon 1 again. Now, the gameplay is, well, Splatoon gameplay, you yeah, go on a team of four, cover up a field, you know, get territories, basically capture the flag kind of stuff, or capture the king of the hill kind of stuff, take, taking area, stuff like that. Uh, again, it's all pretty simple, but you have some new game types, as well as some new modes, such as Salmon Run, some new competitive modes, I mean, ranked modes. The single player is back, and you get to use new, basically different weapon types, although that turns out to be a bigger letdown to the very end of it, but you know, that's a minor complaint. Again, there's a lot of new here on top of new outfits, as well as, again, they just did a recent update where they added even more ranked matches and more customization options, which, again, they're updating the game, and not even to mention new weapon types, new weapons, and, of course, new stages, which is the lifeblood of any mostly online multiplayer shooter. Now, before any detractors want to show up and mention it, the voice chat thing is pretty annoying. Having to use a get, having to use an external app for in-game voice chat, and yes, getting it to work is incredibly lame, and it's basically an annoyance. You have to keep make sure your phone is on and doesn't go into hibernate. Then make sure the app is still running. Again, it's all a gigantic pain in the ass. But I'm going to set my position on this. I'm okay with it. I'm against someone who doesn't particularly like using voice chat in games. I have to say that actually deters me from playing most multiplayer games is voice chat, mainly because I don't feel like being yelled at every five minutes because I made one mistake. It's very annoying. It's honestly pushing me away from video games than towards video games. And especially considering that this is again Nintendo and more family friendly, blah blah blah, it makes more sense that they want to prevent people from uh, you know doing certain things to kids. As well as see how competitive people can get on online games. Yes, the app is dumb, There, are, but there are plenty of other ways to get around it, you know, especially if you're playing with friends. TeamSpeak, Discord, Skype, stuff like that, you know. There are plenty of ways to get around this, hooking with this feature. It's an annoyance, but again, it's only a tiny annoyance and a tiny feature in an otherwise great game. So in the end, even though I do wish there was probably a bit more to this game, I'm more than happy with what we have, and I do ultimately enjoy what this game is in its current state, as well as what else Nintendo plans to put into it before it finishes up with this one. And honestly, it feels a worthy follow-up, and I really do love seeing this game being added, 
as another great Nintendo franchise, and I hope we get more great Nintendo franchises and more of this particular franchise.